a swig of coffee here. <laughs> <laughs> Wake up. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Entrepreneur Hour, where I show you cool new technology, cool new business ideas, and investment opportunities. Today, my special guests are Steve and Roberto of Vest. Uh, Steven, or Steve, I don't know. <laughs> Steve's good. Steve's good. Um, so basically, today, our guests have a very, very cool product that I want you guys to really understand and learn about. So how I normally start the show is I talk about how we met. So this is our first time actually seeing each other, but I, I've heard about your app through investment partners I'm working with. Um, and it was super intriguing to me. Uh, but as, as this is called the entrepreneur hour, I want you guys to talk about your background, each of your origin stories. how do you become entrepreneurs first? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I guess I'll, I'll kick it off. I mean, I started in the music business. Um, I played drums for a band when I was in high school and college and a guys, a group of guys I grew up with started a band. I went off to college. I wasn't going to be a professional drummer. Um, they kept sending me tapes back in the day. It was cassette tapes. I was working for uh, a music management firm called Direct Management in college. So it was B-52s, Joe Jackson, Wire Train, Echo and the Bunny Man. So I kind of got into the business. I started working for Ice-T's manager um, in the early 90s. And they gave me a tape again and said, can you help get a sign? And I shopped that tape around for a couple of years. Got them a deal at Atlantic Records in 1992. Um, and they were called Mighty Joe Young at that time. And then we, we changed the name right before the record was released to Stone Temple Pilots. So wow. I started off managing them from 1990 through about 2000 and had another 24 other acts within that 10 year period signed to major labels and publishers. So um, that was how I kind of started off from high school to college to a professional career in the music industry. Awesome. How about you, Roberto? Okay, well, I was born in El Salvador. I'll start there just a little bit because I think it's important the context of entrepreneurship sometimes to kind of begin where you where you started uh, kind of like your dreams, right? So I was born in El Salvador. I came in when I was seven years old. I got into finance very early on. I saw a movie called Wall Street. I think everybody saw that when I was a teenager um, and ended up working for Oppenheimer and Company at the ripe old age of 23, became registered and licensed at 24 and started running my own trading business in my late 20s to 30s with 150 traders and about seven or eight offices nationwide called TradeStar. From there, we launched a quantitative fund in New York. I lived in Manhattan for about 10 years. It's actually um, where I really started to get the entrepreneurial bug. I co-founded a company called Circus. Uh, this way, I think we lost Steve. Yeah, yeah uh, I, I co-founded a company called uh, Circus uh, which is still in operation now uh, uh, with, with a gentleman in L.A. It's basically Uber for people. We collect data from individuals and then we invite them to attend and pay them to attend different events and brands. And the idea there is that everybody is a microchasm of social connections. So if you're a local restaurant, you want to curate and invite local people to attend. Right. And then they'll tag and share on Facebook. Hey, new sushi spot on the west side, great food, or hey, there's a brand, uh, there's a liquor brand, and we happen to collect your data, right, from Facebook, very primitive data, not deep, that you like that brand, or you like sushi, and, and then we would invite you and pay you to attend and share that. That company is currently valued at 200 million, it's still right. in operation. Uh, and the reason why that's relevant is that's where I met Steve. We had brought Steve in to help us with concerts and venues and expanding the business. And one day I'm having a cup of coffee, as you probably saw me grabbing this morning. And I asked Steve, I'm like, what are you doing here? Because to me, the ability to be able to be involved with creating music, right? Which is so important culturally, emotionally, like the soundtrack of our lives. Uh, what are you doing here? And he's like, well, this is how financing uh, in, in the business has changed uh, in, the, in the music industry. And his, acumen and ability in the music industry and then me thinking of it as an asset and and, and and a position kind of brought us to the realization of why couldn't fans participate at the very core value of, of of music and that's the intellectual property because the reality is the difference for creators not just the musicians themselves but the labels the publishers everyone involved is diversification of risk so if you like drake or if you're into any type of musician you'll often notice that 
that musician will be hot, and then boom, five other guys just like him get signed, right? Yeah, Maybe yeah. yeah. Is, but it's always like you know, so that's why you'll see like trap, and it's like twenty trap guys, or you'll see yeah. like you know, same sound, like you hear the same sound, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like Maluma, and then there's like 20 Malumas. There's, oh, the new Jay Baldwin. But but the reality is it's labels are just doing what any business does, right? We're making money over here. This is hot. Let's let's pepper. So how do you really benefit uh, art in a very direct way? We really uh, believe that it's money at the end of the day, right? Being able to not only pay your bills, but get studio time, get a publicist, um, get marketing and advertising, and, and also... Um, you know, for labels and publishers, knowing your customer, they genuinely don't know who's buying the content. Right? We sat with Post Malone's manager, Dre London, and then uh, with, with their lawyer in New York, and Steve will tell you, Post's new album had come out, and yo, it's like number one album in the, in the world and in the country. He, he didn't know who his fans were. I mean, Steve will speak a little bit to that oh, if you want. Yeah, he, he, he was playing Madison Square Garden, for example, right? 20,000 people in an arena. He doesn't know who any of them are. He comes on stage, does his show, he leaves. Ticketmaster knows, Live Nation knows, yep. Madison Square Garden yep. knows. They have the point of purchase credit card sale, but the artist has no clue. So yep. there's a big interest in direct to consumer right now. And I think one of our biggest clients, uh, BMG, is a big publisher, fourth largest in the world. They are very smart. They're looking ahead to say, we've got digital content. There's no reason we need to rely on a, on, a, on a distribution network like in the old days where you had to have a, a retailer selling a CD or a radio station playing a song or Spotify distributing it online. We can do that directly. So they're interested in the consumer. They want to know that data. They want to see where it comes from. But we took, as Rob was saying, a, a very, very deep model of the music business, the publishing model, which looks at copyright and where all those earnings come in. Those have always been B2B businesses, right? A music publisher like Sony ATV or UMG or Warner's takes money in from uses and licenses around the world and distributes that money back to the creators of that content. We said, what's missing from that equation, right? What was missing was the most important part, the fan, right? Mm -hmm. The fan is who actually spends the time and the money. They'll spend $300 for a concert ticket or $65 for a t-shirt because they love that artist or they love that song. And that was taken away from that equation. And if you look at what happened in, in, in the investment markets here in the late 80s, Prior to 88 or 89, the average consumer could not buy into a stock, right? You had to be accredited. You have to have a broker dealer. You had to buy into a tranche of 10 or 100 shares at a time. Now with Robinhood, for example, you can buy a fraction of a share on your phone like that. We yep. wanted to make the copyright IP market. We're, we're starting with music, but we're going into books, videos, patents, anything with an underlying royalty stream available to the average person for as little as $5. Right. And, and democratize this process. Make these people that are your fans, your advocates, make them shareholders in your actual music. That's where we saw the power. And that's why we're different from pretty much every platform that's out there. It's, you know, so, it's also about advocacy. Just so I mean, I'm, I just want to hop in because this is a really yeah, important sure. narrative for, for us. It's the idea that someone's going to pay you money to wear your jersey. Think about soccer, football, any sport. You're spending a crazy amount of tick on tickets. You're buying eight dollar beer. You're consuming ten dollar hot dogs while wearing their brand, right? So people are very connected to music. So the concept and the idea is that we consume content. Now here's an opportunity to have that consumption benefit you. If this is my favorite artist, I'm going to listen to this song. I'm going to listen to that music video. I'm going to share that now because I have a vested interest, and that's actually where the name comes from. That's why I wanted to say that. Ah, nice, nice. That's pretty good. Okay, so. For people watching that may not fully understand the business, the music business model, right? If you had to explain it in the simplest way of how it was before and then what you're doing now, right? Music business past versus now, how would you explain the difference? So it started out as, as a top-down model, right? It used to be labels, publishers, big money, big companies, trickling down to the artist, the actual creator of the IP. Now, what we see is that flipping over, right? The artists, the guys that actually and the girls that create this music now have the power to do things on their own without relying on the big banks or the labels and publishers. What, what our platform does is help democratize that process to give, like Robert mentioned earlier, artists the actual funding, the financial ability to make more records, to tour, to build their team, to do things that are important. The labels used to do, but the labels are very selective, right? I mean, one yep. out of maybe a million artists gets a record. Yep. So that's a very, very small club. 
we want to make this available. If you're, if you're, as Robert likes to say, a banjo player in <laughs> Kentucky, but you've got 100,000 fans, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to monetize and have a career, right? But a label's not going to sign you because banjo music's not very popular right now. But that doesn't take away from you as a creator or you as a as a craftsman. There's a market for it. It may not be big enough for a label, but correct. Yeah, correct. yeah. I mean, uh, we, we look at Nipsey Hussle, who was an early advocate of the company, early um, uh, had very very early involvement, and as as we know, he he passed away. He was a one of these guys that was surprising at every level. I mean, he'd quote you and Dries and Horwitz at lunch. I mean, a, a true loss. I would say, not just for the music industry, but for a community. But he was a big advocate on the proud to pay campaign. He believed that I'm making art for my community and I'm representing something, right? And because of that, why is it? And and this is actually going back to one of Steve's favorite quotes. I'm pointing the wrong way. No, he yeah, says, that's the right way. That's the right way. <laughs> yeah, you 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 read a book maybe once, you watch a movie maybe a few times, and look at the price points of those things. Music which you consume incessantly. Somebody picked a dollar. Why? Why is it just a dollar, right? What? What is? What is the narrative behind that? And, and what we want to do is be able to provide fans at all levels, national or just like, hey, I'm a guy in Chicago. I feel this guy represents me. He gets me. How can I support that effort to create content? And then for the larger companies, it's also being able to take a look at musicians uh, on uh, w- w- with less risk because if there's a fan involvement where they're buying your IP. Then you know that when you step in, and that actually ended up happening with Nipsey later on, where um, uh, I, I think he ended up signing with um, Jay Z's label, you know, down the road. But before that, he had an imprint deal. And what people were really surprised at is what his net worth was when Nipsey had passed away. Some very established artists had made considerably less than Nipsey, as an independent artist, had made. So there's, you know, this whole concept and idea of owning your creation, of owning uh, uh, yourself, right? And if you look at Joe Rogan and you look at, uh, you know, what that has basically done is it's set a bar for the value of IP. Joe Rogan made 120 to 180 million, arguably, right? Off of the deal with Spotify. And people are like, that's a lot of money. But Spotify stock went up over a billion dollars on that deal. So if, if I said, you know, I'll give you 100 million, you give me a billion, we'll do that all day. Right. So sure. it's really having an understanding of what the core value. I mean, Steve, these are crazy numbers, right? So, Steve, how many albums did Stone Temple Pilots sell? About 40 million globally. How much was each album? 1899 retail. That's a CD. Okay. So, how much did that album cost to make? Uh, less than a half a million dollars. So w- when you're talking about it's explosive, like billion do- like <laughs> it's, about, it's close to a billion dollars in gross revenue, correct? And again, very little of that trickles down to the artist, right? I think yes. even at that point, we might have had a fifteen percent royalty deal with the label. Yeah, the label fronts all the money; they do all the promotion, they spend all that money up front to build that machine, and they are the machine. But at some point, the artist doesn't need that any further, right? And so, I think. So what- what do labels do now then? Like, like well, what is the reason for a label now? Well, they, they do what they've always done, right? They're cherry picking. Right now, they just look at, they literally look at social media and pick out who has the most followers, likes, or <laughs> subscribers and say, we need to sign that band. Here's $8 million, right? So they're they're in the business of home runs, right? They're looking yeah. for a top level pop hit. They want to have a return on their money of 10X or 20X. They are really, they, they've stopped doing artist development, in my in my opinion, maybe 35 years ago, right? They are not looking at getting a small artist and building them into a big artist. They want to sign a big artist and make them a bigger artist, right? So they're a bank. They're an amplifier. They take what exists and and put it in their machine and blow it out, which, and I think there's a real need for that. There's there's a value to that at a certain level, but that's a very small- It's like one percenters, right? It's less than one percent. I would say one hundredth of one percent are going to get to that level. I mean, how many- major major music stars are there I, I can almost count them in you know on, on two or three hands it's very few and, and then you'd be surprised at how fast that drops off right i mean it's 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 like actors if you go to screen actors bill which is the union for actors in hollywood there's maybe you know less than a half of one percent that make a living from acting but there's probably you know two million yeah. actors in sag that that are in the union and they work every once in a while but they can't make a career out of it and, and, and what i will say Sorry, Steve. I was going to say, our goal is to help musicians make a career out of what they do, 
right? My, my other thing I like to say is I can go down the street and get a job hanging drywall for 40 bucks an hour with just my back, just carrying drywall on my back, no skills. But if I play guitar or I sing or I play drums or keyboards for 20 years and hone my craft and practice and practice and practice, it's very difficult for me to make a living with that skill. And I, that, that, that saddens me because I think there's a lot of value in music and the creators have never had a chance to really benefit at a level that keeps food on the table and has a career. And, and we can bring up one of our independent artists, Julian Extra, who was driving Lyft, right? And, in and LA, some, yeah. In, in LA. And someone said, do you think this platform will improve the quality of music? And I said, how can it not, right? If, if we take a guy that had music as a hobby, he did it between midnight and three in the morning, but now I can make that his career. He could spend eight or 10 hours a day making music. I think that is only going to result in better yeah. songs. Better so music. explain explain how your app does that. How does it make yeah. him? I mean, we're, yeah, we're happy, we're happy to go into that. But I just want to add one thing on sure. the labels, which is, you know, the distribution that used to be controlled is now open. So if you want to really look at how they add value and, and the reality of it is, there are more, you know, first episode of American Idol. Okay, that's a lot, a lot of people that think they're talented, a lot, a lot of people that have dreams, but just are not right. But they're out there and now they're putting out content. So if you look at Spotify, people can self launch the, 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 the amount of IP, right, is daunting. So now the labels have become to some degree curators and spotlights in an ocean of invisibility. Right. And, and how do you change that to me? Obviously, it's you know, being uh, risk adverse by having your fans involved and in creating your own ecosystem so that the label see you anyways and can maybe take you to a bigger height, but just stating that. So what, and then now going back to your question, what we do as, as an app is we allow fans to buy into pre-existing royalty streams in three different asset classes, which make up royalties in general. And, you know, Steve has so, uh, forgotten more than I know, so I'll let him so yeah, explain those. Explain, explain royalties to me. Like, like if I'm, I have no idea what is music royalties, yeah. All right, so you have a song, right? That song, say you're signed to a label, you're, you're like a Jay-Z or somebody. That song is, is created, you record it, you put it in a distribution channel like Spotify, Apple Music, Radio, Target, Best Buy, anywhere that it's going out to the public. Any time that song is used, in other words, played on the radio, played on a TV show, in a commercial, licensed for a product, licensed for a TV commercial, anywhere in the world, there's a royalty collected through a licensing mechanism, right? It's called a, a performing, ro performing royalty organization, a PRO. They collect monies in, I think, 147 different countries around the world. In the U.S., it's ASCAP, BMI, CSAC. There's another, a couple smaller ones. Um, in most countries, that's one unit. So can in Canada, PRS in London, England, uh, Gamma in Germany, uh, CompCode in Korea, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Most of them are quasi-governmental units because um, it's one collection society for that country. But what they do is get a blanket license from the user. So say you have a bar that has a capacity of 100 people. They're going to say, okay, you're playing music to 100 people every night for 365 days a year. We're going to charge you $3,000, right? So they pay a blanket annual license to the PRO in that country for, for the right to play the music to the public, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the PRO collects that money, say it's Germany, say it's GEMA, G-E-M-A, which is the PRO in Germany. They take the royalty in from the performing rights organization. They take the royalty license money from Germany, from that bar, and they look at, okay, who are the artists that contributed to that music source in that bar for a year? And they go, okay, this song was played 20 times, this song was played 50, and they monitor, they're supposed to monitor, they used to use paper logs, now they have digital sampling systems, kind of like Shazam, where they can track what songs are played where. It's, it gets a little bit of a dark science here, but they come up with a number and they go, okay, Miguel, you wrote you know, two thirds of the song. You have 66% of the song. You're a US citizen. You're an ASCAP member. We're going to give you, you know, because that play earned eight cents, you get two cents of that eight cents. That money comes from Germany to ASCAP. Because you're an ASCAP member in the US, ASCAP distributes that money to you. You get your two cents. Right. Multiply that by every time your songs are played everywhere in the world for that year. And that's where you get Jay-Z money. That's where you get money from Beyonce. Big artists that have more plays, more usage, more licenses make more money. This system has been in place for about 100 years plus. It's very, you know, it's archaic in many ways. They're slow to pay. Like to get that two cents from Gemma, Gemma's going to hold it for probably 
you know, 60, 90, 180 days to turn it around. Then they send it to ASCAP. ASCAP's going to hold it for another 60, 90, 180 days. So by the time you get it, it could be a year or 18 months even at the extremes for you to see that payment. All these artists are familiar with it because anytime you see a royalty check, it will tell you where it came from and show you, you know, the period in which it was paid. So that has that changed now with music streaming? How has music streaming changed royalty? There are some platforms that pay more frequently, right? Streaming platforms like Spotify play, pay monthly. YouTube pays monthly. There's a couple that pay much quicker, but there's still delays, right? To register, you have to register. And then they either if they work on a monthly, quarterly, or semi-annual basis, you don't start your collections until the, fall, the beginning of the next period. In other words, if you sign up in the middle of a period, they'll accrue for that, but it won't actually go on your account until the beginning of the next period. So if it's a six-month payment period, by, by yearly, by annually, and you sign up, you know, July 5th, guess what? You don't start until January 1st of the next year, almost six months later. So there are wow. pitfalls in the system. It's becoming more efficient. One of our goals is to help that happen. We want artists to get paid in real time. There's The technology is there. There's no reason I can't hold my phone up to Shazam and hear a song in two seconds, identify what it is, know who the rights holders are and know where to pay them. But for some reason, there's many, many reasons sure. that hasn't quite happened yet. It's getting there. But maybe in the next five years, we'll see, you know, market improvements. We hope that our platform takes advantage of some of these inefficiencies right now and gets the money into the artist's hands much, much quicker. So simply, what does Vest do? What problem does it solve? And how the, does it solve? The, the biggest problem, again, is putting money in the hands of creators of the content, right? So if I'm a musician, I make a record and put it out. I may not see income on that record for 18 months. Right. And, and it's hard for me to do that efficiently without a label or publisher in, the, in, in place. So what we do is allow a direct to consumer relationship. It's a marketplace. Right. It's a willing seller and a willing buyer. And you put your your songs on our platform or a fraction of your songs. Again, it's not selling copyright. There's no transfer of ownership. There are full reversions. You're allowing your fans and the public to make an advance against your royalty stream. Right. So what we're doing is aggregating three, five or 10 years of income because those are our reversion periods and allowing the artist to receive three, five or 10 years of money within 30 to 60 days. Right. And, and for many people, that's a that's a game changer because now they can pay the rent. Now they can buy a new guitar. Now yeah. they can go on tour. They can do a that, music video. They can yeah, that hire a publicist. It, it's, it's really I mean, the, the devil's in the details. So, you know, if you're talking about bigger companies, for them, it's data and being able to sign new acts and being able to produce videos as well and do all of these different things from advances. But also, you know, it's like someone's paying you to do the marketing. Like, hey, I'm going to give you, you know, the average spend on our app is up between 100 to $110. So you're having someone give you money and then they're going to take that digital asset and hopefully share it and talk about it. So it becomes kind of like a ground team. But if you're an emerging artist where I think this is really where it gets interesting. And I'll use Julian as an example, and we have others, but Julian took that money, got on TV in Chicago, did a couple of morning shows, moved to New York. He did a video with us. Uh, and that video was his number one video period that he had ever made, got the most streams, got the most views. And now he's getting sync licenses and moving forward with his career. Now, Julian is extremely talented. So we're not saying this yeah, is necessarily happening because of us, but we are part of that story. We are, the money that he raised allowed him to do these things, allowed him to be a better version of who he was because he didn't have to worry. Um, we had a producer by the name of Chuck English, a uh, very prominent producer, who I think raised about 60000 out of the app, was one of the first producers to take a decent amount of money. He's doing a soundtrack for a show on Showtime. And the money that he raised allowed him to go to Chicago, get an apartment there, stay, negotiate. In a lot of cases, look, if you're an artist, right um and a deal or something comes up that you want to participate in how are you going to go fly to new york and go meet with a team right you have rent you have bills you have families like there's a lot of opportunities that are limited by our financial capabilities or hey you know if it's, we're talking about an ocean of musicians if you have a music video forget about it you're you're invisible it's just the reality that we live in. The, the real number one music distribution platform is the platform we're sitting on right now, which is YouTube, right? Yeah. So you need a little bit of money. You need the people that believe in you. And yeah. how else are you going to do it? Hey, Bob, let me borrow some money, blah, blah, blah. Here's a really clean and simple way to get people to participate, to have a contract that exists, that tracks and collects the royalties directly from the source. 
We're not going to the production company. We're not going to the label. We're not, we're not going to third parties to collect the money. We're going to the PROs. So the other thing is it, it yeah. works for established artists as well. I mean, I yeah. think one of the sweet spots we're starting to see emerge out of this is an artist that maybe had a big fan base 20 years ago, right? Prior to social media. So say you're like, you know, we, we use Tom Petty all the time. Yeah, I, see, about, I saw Tone Loke on your app. Yeah, Tone Loke, yeah. perfect, right? <laughs> Most Tone Loke fans are probably 50 plus right now. If they remember like, you know, Funky Cole Medina, is that? Or is I that, saw one. I um, saw one at the grocery store, Steve. <laughs> in the top Loke down, here? playing Funky Cole Medina. This guy was like reliving <laughs> where, where he peaked. He peaked in high school. I could see it in his eyes and, and he was enjoying that song. But that artist, right, he probably doesn't have a way to connect with those fans, right? They're pre, they're on Facebook, but they're not, he didn't set up structures because he wasn't doing that 20 yeah. years ago, yeah. right? And, and now he doesn't have a label. Now he's not touring anymore, but he still has big songs that are out there, but no one's working them, right? There's no label, but there's no machine behind it pushing that. If he puts up a small piece, 1% of his rights, and say he wants to raise a half a million dollars, He's got, Tone Look maybe has, I don't know, 10 million fans globally. He could reach out to them on his socials. He could let us reach out to them through our social platforms because we market directly to the fans. And it's very easy to find Tone Look fans or Jay-Z fans or Adele fans or Beyonce fans anywhere online. I mean, they basically yeah. wave the flag and say, my yeah. favorite artist yeah. you know, is Drake. Very so it's, it's easy to find them. We make them aware that, that Tone Look is offering an ownership stake, a royalty ownership stake in one of his songs, it may be your favorite song, for X, right? And that brings them in. And what we do is we let the creator and the buyer connect, right? Which is the other part of this. A lot of other platforms, in fact, most all of them, never give you the actual connection. They'll give you a heat map. Spotify will say, we spent this song yeah, yeah. 22 million times in the Northeast, basically males between 18 and 24. That's good news, right? Good stats. How do I touch those males in the Northeast between 18 and 24? They don't give you a connection point. We think that's your natural customer, right? If that's your customer, why shouldn't you know them? Back to the Post Malone on stage at Madison Square Garden. Why shouldn't he know who's in the audience, right? Ticketmaster, yeah. great. They should, know, they should know too. But the artist on stage that brought those people in, we think he should know or she should know who the people are that are his or her customers. So we will share the data. You're saying he should have the data. hundred yeah. percent. Right. Because if yeah. he wants to sell something else or let them know about a tour or, or distribute no some album. digital product or yeah, yeah, something else and connect, it doesn't matter. Those are his customers, whatever yeah. he wants to do. Yeah. Someone asked us, well, what if, what if they spam them? I said, those are your customers. Are you going to spam them? Yeah. No. Uh, I mean, if you make a mistake and I've been, them, saying, this, I've been saying this for years. So, so if you could, so I'm going to simplify it so I, I can make it in a sentence. Pretty much Vest allows artists to have better cash flow in a way. That's how I see it. For an artist, I can say instead of waiting and hoping, you can let the people who really believe in you invest in you up front and let you grow faster, right? And then yes. on the opposite right. side, you allow people who are interested to to win on the upside of that um Fan them, I guess, or you know, like if you really like someone, you can invest in their future, and then if they do grow and become huge, you win on that investment, right? You I mean, become a shareholder in their yeah. royalty stream. I mean, it's, it's a really it's, powerful narrative. I mean, if let's look powerful. at it like it, it really depends, right? If I had a million dollars today or a million dollars in 10 years, what's more valuable to me as a businessman, right? Like as someone that can make that money work, if I believe that a million dollars today is exponentially going to blow my business to a whole other level. And the reason I say that is because it's not always the artist directly. You have writers, you have producers, you have teams yeah, 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 yeah. that manage other artists. And will that million dollars allow you to make a hundred videos, get touring going, whatever, and then exponentially grow the entire business model? And the answer on that advance is yes. If the answer is like, I'm gonna take that billion and go pop bottles and maybe it's not the smart <laughs> play for you. But 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 at its very core, fundamentally, it's it's the value of that capital today. And in return for that, I'm going to allow you to participate on the growth of that million, uh, at which Goldman Sachs, you know, they have a really good analysis that they're saying by 2030, they're expecting an increase of over 50% in value uh, on, on, on song rights. And, and here's the thing, and, and, you know, you can't unplay a song, which is what Steve likes to say. You can't, they will always grind out and make money uh, and, and almost as an annuity. 
as obviously, a separate, it's an alternative yeah, yeah. asset class, right? Like, yeah, like yeah that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing as I, as I learn about investment because I'm I'm creating a fund. Every all rich people take their money out of cash in some way, right? You so have to another way yeah. to take your money out of cash, right? So, but you're looking at something oh, that's it's not ahead. correlated to the markets. It's been around for hundreds of years. You can see with your own eyes and ears how well a song is doing, right? You know, wow, that guy's flying around or he sold, he said, 50 million streams. You can see the result of where that distribution goes. So now, how do you play in that pool, right? How do you play in that game? It's never been possible before. Never been so possible. We're, what we're doing is letting you people the jump in. So one thing I did notice, and I want to make sure I, I, I have this right, because it didn't seem right. You can't lose in investing in music royalties, right? Like you get your money back no matter what, at least. We use we use probably the biggest structure in music publishing. It's called a reversion, right? So every major publisher in the world uses the same structure. What that means is they give you an advance. Say Sony, Sony gives you $500,000. They have your catalog for five years, right? After five years, if they've only recouped 400 of that thousand back, in other words, a $100,000 deficit, they stay in those rights beyond that five-year term until they're made whole, or the artist can pay that $100,000 difference and get the rights back. It's, back. It's, a, it's a standard music publishing reversion, and that's exactly what we use here. So the risk is really how right. long will it take to, to recoup that advance that I put in? It could be one year, it could be 10 years, it could be 50 years. We don't know. We don't make any kind of prediction that way at all. But we sure. will say that you will have a piece of that royalty stream until you are recouped. Wow. And if anything wow. occurs in the meantime, I've never heard an investment opportunity like that. Actually, <laughs> go ahead, well, go. I mean, no, 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 nobody had before. We, we, I mean, I hate to say it, people call you crazy till till, till they call you great, right? So <laughs> you, you hear a lot of no's, and the hubris behind the no's are really interesting, and that's for an entire other podcast. But yeah, you know, one of the one of the really interesting things is that streaming, right, which is the savior of music, if you look at the data has increased the valuation of catalog an average of 15 to 20% annual. So you're talking about a very boring product, so to speak, because you know music does this, it'll spike up and then it just flatlines and slowly starts to grow. So, you know, this is the mainstay, this is the lifeblood of all content. And this will lead into kind of like what we're looking and why we called the company Vest in that music market, which was the original name of the company. I mean, we want to do what we're doing for music, for YouTube channels, for podcasts, for, you know, to allow a fan. You know, like you know, you're going to be able to invest in the entrepreneur hour one day. <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying. Like, literally, you'll be able to say, I'm willing to give up 1% of my future royalties on the entrepreneur hour to my fans and people that believe in what I'm doing, right? For the next three years, because obviously YouTube is a short term sure. thing, right? Sure. So let's say let's say you're let's say it's an average of a thousand a month that you're looking to get in advance, right? That's thirteen thousand per year. That's thirty six thousand for three years. Now you have thirty six thousand. What can you do with that as the owner of a channel? Can you get better equipment? Can you get a team to help you? Can you yeah. do marketing? Can you get some um, you know write ups? Whatever it is, right? But if you think that that money is of value today, and you're willing to let your fans who now have a micro fraction, they're going to subscribe. They're going to like, and they're going to share the videos. Every it single has, one of those. It gives so them an ability to move the, in the, the success of the person yeah. you're, yeah, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. Makes but a lot it's a fraction, and you're not giving up, say, the entrepreneur hour is not co-owned. The royalties are now being bifurcated and shared, right? It's That's amazing. It's an amazing concept. So before we move on, definitely like this video. Go download the best app. The link yes. is in the description. Check out the songs. So there's some questions. I'm going to, I'm going to get to audience questions. I have a lot more questions, but I want to get to the audience questions first. Um, all right. So do the fight. All right. So wait, so Allison asked, do we need labels anymore? You answered that. You pretty much said they are, there's a reason to have them. Of course. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Now she asked, do the prices of the music you buy vary from how popular it is? We don't set pricing. Right, the, we allow the artist or the rights holder to set pricing. We provide some guidance, and if the pricing seems crazy, it's kind of like the valuation of a of a company, right? It, it reminds me of tech startups. Like you're investing in a music startup, kind of. In it's some, common. for some, like you know, the statements are very transparent, right? So the statements tell you, let's say this song does 
you know, 10,000 on average, when you look at the quarterly report, it does 10,000 a month, 3,000 a month. I think one of the most interesting things is that you're kind of opening Pandora's box because a lot of a lot of these fractional ownerships, they equal a lot of money over time, but you'd be surprised at the size of the checks. Some are massive and some is like $300, right? Sure. So, sure. So the, 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 the idea of the valuation is really based on what it's making times the reversion period, right? So if the song is averaging $1,000 a month and he's putting up 10%, that's $100 a month that he's honoring to put up on the platform and it's a five-year uh, reversion, now you have the number, right? And that yeah. gets placed on the platform. What the fan is betting is that that song will continue to be popular, that it might get some sync licenses. But, you know, IP just grows normally, right? Where the excitement is, I mean, this is a crazy story. We had a guy in New Jersey. He bought uh, Mac Miller. He bought a Mac Miller song, the entirety. And then Mac Miller, like, passed away. And his, he paid $3,000 for the IP. His first check was 1500 And he's got, like, another, what, five years of this, I think, Steve? I mean, he's got a lot of more royalties. He's got a three-year deal. And he was actually, yeah. I think, in Kansas. But and, the, oh, point, Kansas he was in New Jersey, the yeah. bigger point is, and I think you're touching on it, Miguel, is that at scale, Right. If a influencer, imagine a Jake Paul on YouTube comes in, right? He's got what, like a hundred million followers. And he says, guys, let's go in on this ISL. Let's go in on this initial song offering. Let's each chip in five bucks on this song and spread it. Right. If each one of those listeners or followers, users, a hundred million of them stream that song one time, that's a hundred million that's more streams. Powerful. And that's the viral of the IP is up. Yeah. Oh, so we just saw that happen. Chance. You have the yeah. chance to make a difference in the value of what you're putting your money into. That's you need. Wow. We, we, we just saw that happen with two YouTubers, right, uh, that played a Phil Collins song. I can feel it coming oh in there. Oh, my God. Two black kids, okay. right? And you're like, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. The song is now charting, right? And you see TikTok videos of older songs, new songs. So imagine I go on the app and I buy a piece of a Phil Collins song and then I do the Phil Collins dance or whatever. And I happen to have, and it goes viral. And a million followers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, no but imagine doubt. you have, you know, you have 2,000 fans that all bought that IP on the app and they coordinate a move, right? I mean, it's all up to the public, right? These are just sure. strategies and thoughts. But if, but if I own a fraction of that song and I'm making a TikTok and I can ping other players on the app and be like, hey, man, no. on Tuesday, let's all drop a viral dance on, you know, Tone Loke. Does it move? I don't know. But the question is, the consumption has value. So, you know, we're talking about oil being less valuable than your data now. So what oh, we're yeah. saying is, if you're going to listen to this, if you're going to play this video, if you're going to listen to that podcast, shouldn't you have a little bit of it? Like, as far as the revenue, shouldn't you participate? Shouldn't yeah, the entrepreneur you know, hour be on your plate, my friend? That's right. That's right. That's what if I'm you're going to listen to a song a thousand times, you're giving Spotify money, might as well get some of it back, right? So, yep. or whatever you watch on YouTube, whatever, it makes a lot of sense to me. But if you're making so, videos on, on TikTok, on Trilla, if you're doing that for fun anyways, right? And you're following other music and other trends, you might as well, you know. If you're sharing those. playlists, make sure that you own a piece of the playlist. <laughs> yeah. right? That's, yeah. that's all 100%. I'm so I got a lot of young people who watch my show because I have a nonprofit where we work with young people, but... So Kevin asked, is there a minimum age you can you have to be to invest in a song? I mean, Apple's minimum, I think, is 13 years old. We were like any other app. We don't actually set that or govern that. But I think whatever age you could be to work on an app or make a purchase on an app uh, applies to, to applies to our platform as well. Those are COPA laws. I think it's 13. I think it's 13. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there you go, Kevin. Invest in your favorite song. All well, right. It's also knowledge, you know. You can learn. I mean, you know you'd be surprised how many people don't know the business they're in. And I'm talking, you know, like just musicians in general, people in general, knowledge is the most powerful thing. And if you can understand song rights, you can understand stocks, you can understand dividends, you can understand a variety of things that are really important, I believe, for young people to be economically literate and understand the value of the things that they're uh, putting, putting money into. I mean, I mean, coming from, you know, uh, a minority, so to speak, and being thrust into the world of finance, it was very eye opening. Nobody keeps their money in cash. Right. That's a less dude. How many people have money stuffed in mattresses in all these types of neighborhoods? That's the understand. number one thing I've found Crazy. as I start talking to investors. They just don't have cash. Any, any way to get 
their money out of cash is yeah. what investors do. But yeah. like Rob said, it's the knowledge, right? And, and if you haven't had someone guide you through this, if you haven't a father or a grandfather, or your uncle or your cousin, tell you how this works, right? I mean, in, in high school, it shocked me. They don't, they don't teach you about mortgages. They don't teach you about interest. I mean, yeah. stop talking about money. Compound, taxes, interest. Right? Compound I mean, interest. I mean, if somebody would have pulled me aside when I was 24, an annuity, a company. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, come on, man. Really? Like, this is some secret? You know, it's so simple, but it's just nobody opens that door. I mean, at least in my school. I, mean, I know in Steve, nobody was like, guys, today we're going to talk about compound interest and the devaluation of money. Yeah. And you're like, you what? They teach you how to write a check. That's literally yeah. fill out this date, <laughs> fill out the name and sign it. Okay, but what? how, how does that system work? How, right? does, how does the banking system work? How does the taxation system work? Right? How does yeah. the investment system so, work? So that's, that's the power that brings is. up a question that someone just asked. Is there any financial literacy that you give the artist? Because you can end up giving an artist money and then they they blow it and they're in a worse position. Well, that's a, that's a really good question because we don't we don't collect from the artist, so we don't control what they do with the money. But but um, we collect from the source, so we're never going to like a writer's house in the Hollywood Hills and we're like, yo, man, you know, <laughs> your, your, your fans are looking for you. Um, you know, I, I, interestingly enough, the PROs are a very powerful safety net, even for the musicians themselves. I would say this. Uh, type of ongoing revenue payment, this annuity, if you will, can be the lifeblood for a lot of guys that wrote a lot of songs and then you know, they just count on this check to live and survive. And Miguel, I think just the fact that they put an ISO on our platform is an education in itself. Right? A lot of them don't understand the different sources of royalties. Like we had lunch with a very, very famous lead singer of a band we, we won't mention, but he's like, we said, do you have songwriter shares? Or do you have publisher shares? He didn't know the difference, right? But yeah, I, he, saw that. I saw that. I on that. It, a lot of songwriters are the ones, at least from what I saw, well, songwriters yeah. are the ones putting up. Yeah, because they get paid later. So you know, we sat with a guy that wrote for Post Malone. Post has a hit. He's touring. He's making a fifty, a hundred and fifty a night back then, just to sing a couple of songs, right? But that that writer that co-wrote that song with him, he's not getting paid for almost a year, Ooh. right? So your pockets are like empty. Is that you know the same I mean? with the person that creates the beat? Is that everybody? Very, that very similar story. So it's not that that money isn't coming for them. It's that money's in the pipeline, right? And, sure. and for a new song, especially, it, it could take a minute. It could take but a it's minute. interesting because we used to, I mean, you know, I used to deal with business managers and lawyers and accountants, right? That was, those are the people that understood the money and where it came from and how it worked in the music business. Today, on this platform, we're dealing almost exclusively with artists. I mean, we do deal with some attorneys and business managers on labels and publishers, but a lot of these independent artists are coming directly to us. So when they say, how does this work? We run them through. We go, look, here's your statement. Here's what you earned over the last 12 months. Here's how much this particular song. I mean, we drill down with yeah. them on, on where the money comes from and where it goes. So I think in that sense, there is an education provided. And it's surprising how many of the creators themselves very little knowledge of how this works. Yeah, but that's I, changing. I yeah, but that's yeah. changing. I think what, what technology, especially technology like yours, the technology in general is doing is eliminating those middlemen layers, right? Including the managers, right? Like you said. So the more <laughs> yeah. that you that you can do it yourself, you will, especially early on, because if you don't even have a manager yet, you well, have to figure this out. I think what it's changing yeah. is control. Right. Because if you have money and you have the ability to run, your, here's the thing, like your know, distribution is there, you know, like if, if I gave you, say, one hundred thousand dollars today for the entrepreneur hour, how much marketing and PR, how many ads could you run on YouTube? How many articles yeah, could you get? Written up? For sure, yeah. yeah and, and that's really the power of it. But it's the money along with a team and people that uh, like, you know, let's talk about some heavyweights in YouTube. What's his name? Paul. What's his name, Steve? Paul. Uh, Jake Paul, Jake Paul, Jake Paul, right? Yeah, Paul, Jake, Jake Paul, right? Uh, oh, Jake Paul, I, yeah. I sat with the guy that's running a music division for him. Listen, that kid may look like he's making fart sounds, but that kid is <laughs> business-minded to the 10th degree, 25 million plus a year. There's an entire staff, a team, a set. That's the difference, right? I mean, sure, it, sure. it looks like they're running around, but you know, behind the scenes... How many people are helping you right now? Just put this together. I'm sure there's two people behind the scenes right now. Yeah, yep. that's what I'm saying, right? 
but but a lot of guys don't realize that. I mean, you know, there's there's a business behind it, and the key to business is money. You know, Wall Street. The best line is, "You can't piss in the tall weeds if you don't have the capital reserves." It's the truth <laughs> in anything, man. Like, no, it's definitely true. Money yeah. can push any idea along faster, right? So, yes. what this platform seems like, if you're a young up and coming artist, not even just young, if you're an up and coming artist, but you haven't got the traction yet. You can take the the believers that you have so far, and they can help push you along faster, right? It's all about engagement, right? We saw that we we tell the story about Julian all the time. He had three thousand Facebook fans, a very small number of fans. He was able to engage every single one of them, right? And that's what set him apart. There's a lot of independent artists that that don't connect with their fans, don't engage them. That's nice, but that's not going to result in success in their career. But if you can engage your fan base, even if it's very small, you will grow that. Right, and this yeah. platform allows you to multiply and multiply exponentially that growth, at the same time giving you that funding ability to grow even faster. All right, that that's awesome. So, if there's any more questions, I got a bunch more. We got like uh, 15 more minutes, but I'll, I'll try to be quick. I'm gonna try to, to to get my best question. So, what makes the app unique? I, I know you're using blockchain technology. This is super interesting as a technologist. Yeah. Why are you using blockchain? We get asked that all the time, and we actually pivoted to this technology early on um, because we felt that's where things were were, were going to go, just in general. And we thought music was a really elegant example of blockchain technology. It's a decentralized ledger that holds who, but what, and when, and what distribution is being adhered to it. And then also the fact that you can fractionalize into multiple multiple pieces that yeah. ledger to us was incredibly valuable. I mean, we imagine a world where Kids can have playlists compete. They'll be able to swap, you know, like like a collectible would. Like, hey man, I got the early Jay Z, and it's also a rite of passage of saying I discovered this artist. And it's not just a conversation anymore. I mean, if you would have told me ten years ago that sneakers, used sneakers, were going to be a multi-billion-dollar industry, <laughs> definitely. I mean, I, I'd be as much in the dark as I am now by the positioning I decided to do this call in. Like, I'm noticing <laughs> I'm just like an outline. That's that's how insanely. <laughs> I, I don't, but it is right. It, 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 but here's the thing, you know, you don't have to understand a technology to participate. Like I'm 48. So Venmo, Hey, happy face, pizza, pizza. It's not me, <laughs> but my little cousin gets that and, sure. that. and it's incredibly popular. So we understood at its core what the technology could do and being able to create almost a collectible and a trackable playlist. So imagine you could compete with your boys and be like, Hey, you know, here's my playlist. Here's your playlist. Let's see who's really better. At sure. our passion, right? Who's really, and then inadvertently, while they're playing with that, guess what? That's like a stock portfolio. That's like a bond. That's like investing in real estate. And then it becomes a really interesting thing. Mm -hmm. I think right? the biggest difference, though, Miguel, is that we involve the fan. I mean, and, and everything yeah. Rob just said is touching on that. There's it's a power. lot of you empower the fan. You empower. Yeah, there's a lot of people that give advances, funding, loans. I mean, every every publisher, label, ASCAP does that. Even none of them involve your audience. Mm. Right. That to us was the missing piece of this. It's like, OK, we have money at whatever percentage. OK, I get loans. I understand loans. How do I involve the millions and millions of people that might be a fan of my music to participate and exponentially grow this? Make them a shareholder. Empower them. Let them participate. That's I, think, the I think it's an amazing idea. But the investor in me wants to know what's the business model? How do you make money on best? We take best a fee. We take a fee. Take a fee on every transaction. Both every five. transaction, correct. Yes. On every transaction. We're eBay. Right? We're, 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 the, we're, the, we're the marketing <laughs> platform. So we want to be the Amazon of IP. Yes. To to, to be right. honest with you, I mean, look, we we even envision being able to do this for video games. You and three friends get together. You make a video game. You put it on the platform. People go to the link. They play with it. They like it, and they want to buy into the future royalty of that game. And then you take that million that you raised, and you launch it in Steam, and it's off and running content you know what i love the entrepreneur hour i want to be a part of this i want to share it to, if, oh, in layman terms it's a local restaurant right the difference between being funded by a bank and being funded by a thousand of your local community members right they're going to eat there they're going to talk about it because that's amazing yeah that's amazing the, i love that the, idea i love the that banks idea. are faceless your fans are not right you can have a relationship yeah. with each one of them if you want and they have a vested interest to grow your entity. That makes that makes so much. I think that's the way the future needs to go. Because right now, if you look, the biggest companies, Jeff Bezos is worth billions. Yeah. But 
the Amazon employees and customers don't really benefit as much from yeah. that value of Amazon, right? So I think this is the way things are going to start to go. That's why I really like the way I like this idea. But you know what? The middle, the middle that's, benefits. That, that's interesting. He yeah. initially and still does allow anybody to sell anything on that platform. Right. You don't always think about that. But if you look at where that item is coming from, it could be coming from some guy in, you know, in Louisiana. That's a yeah. single person. Operation. That's what I was going to say. The, the, the middle, the middle benefits, 50 percent of the sales on Amazon are currently by third party mark uh, companies. Yep. And just to give you an idea and scope of the market, uh, less than a year ago, a group of guys started acquiring Amazon stores and raising private capital. Their current valuation under the Amazon umbrella is a billion dollars. <laughs> Wow. So everything is, you know, just because someone has, and, and keep in mind that ecosystem has been around for a while, just because someone hasn't done it. I mean, people would look at that and go, Oh, that's, that's, that's smart. Why didn't I do it? Yet, sometimes it's right in front of your face, but ultimately it's scale and growth is consumers. They're buying consumers. What we're saying is it's kind of a similar story, you know, get the consumer involved, get the people that are into your content involved and in advocating. So I, it's 10 minutes left. I like to ask two questions of most entrepreneurs when I, when I remember, but every company needs more of something other than definitely go download the app. What else do you guys need to get this app to be as large as possible? I mean, I think number one is we need key artists involved, right? We just inked the deal with ice T he's our first after Nipsey is Nip Nipsey obviously has passed. Um, but, He's our first key artist that is the performer that can reach out to his fan base directly, right? We've been dealing a lot with writers, publishers, producers. They don't really have the fan base that the performing artist has. Ah, oh, got right? it. So they can't once, bring the audience to the platform yeah. because yeah. the yeah. co-writer of Beyonce's song doesn't have a big following. No one sure. knows who that is actually, but sure. people know who Ice T is. People know who key artists are, and once we see a number of them start to pull six, seven figures off this platform. That's a game changer for yeah, us. Yeah, it's either the artists or the fans creating content with the IP. So those are two yeah. really important things that we need to ultimately happen in the app. The fact that you can buy a song and immediately go to Trilla and make a song and make a dance and make a viral video. Bro. These are the things that because these these things move the needle. And then as always, the ABCs of of entrepreneurship is raising money. You know, <laughs> just like what our platform is offering uh, musicians and creators is what we ourselves need. We need more funding. We have a super low cost of user acquisition and we have a roadmap uh, to, to, to get to where we need to get. And as always, we need to raise more capital. And that's uh, I think the key for any entrepreneur is just understanding that that game doesn't really end for a never. very, very long. Ne yeah, it never ends. I mean, it, never, it, never, it never ends. Yeah, it never ends. So that's what I tell, I tell entrepreneurs that are creating stuff like what you're creating. If you're the CEO of this, understand that you will constantly be raising money um, because as you grow, the money need is cash flow issues with any type of business. Everything, you're going to get to a point everything. where you need money to get to the next level, even if you're yeah. making a lot of money. So, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, Amazon, Amazon could have been profitable a, a, a long time ago, but the Basil was really about growth and ran it in the red on purpose. There's, there's a lot of things that come into play with that. But ultimately, I think for anybody out there thinking of starting a tech startup, you're going to be a crab. And what that means is you think you're walking straight. Crabs <laughs> don't walk straight. You're going to get there, but I it's going to be before. really hard. <laughs> it's, it's things that you never thought of are going to come up. Problems and solutions and pivots. But you got to just, you know, yep. uh, you just got to always move forward. You got to just fight the good fight. Yeah, that's why the team is so important, and right? I see I see both guys work well together because the idea has to change. It's whether the team is built right to 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 make that change and make it effective, right? So you I, gotta, I, I you gotta be open. You gotta yeah. be able to work with. I mean, Rob's like the best partner I think I've ever had. He's he's super open. There's there's been hard times. We have we have things that we have to face. You know, every every so often that are very difficult. But I think both he and I communicate well. I think uh, the fact that we can step back for a second and assess things. I don't even think we've really had a, a deep argument. We disagree on a lot of things, but there's no but fighting, it, right? It, we, stems, we, it stems from having respect and valuing yeah. each other's opinion. I yeah. think people can sometimes be like in life, you know, dismissive. And it's also super important to surround yourself with people that add value to you. And this is in your personal life as well as in business, right? You don't want to be in a situation 
in your personal life where you're surrounded by people that are combative and lead, leading you down uh, the wrong direction. It happens in startups. You'll see sure, sure. founders well, yeah. bury each other. It's sure. emotionally toxic to even come in the office. And you know, yeah. I've had that experience in the past. I won't yeah. talk about it. But it just really emotionally drains you as would a bad marriage or a relationship. And a lot of the way we behave carries on into business. So yeah, it's really it important. Yeah, and this is why I think it's so important what you're doing is sharing uh, the entrepreneur story because ultimately I think that is the foundation of America. If you look at other countries, the one secret sauce that they just can't quite copy is the entrepreneur mentality that Americans have. And I think it's really based on the fact that we all came from somewhere else and just to yeah, do that. Yeah, just yeah. somewhere in your dream, DNA, yeah. some guy was like, you know what, I'm going to cross that ocean. I'm going to walk that desert. I'm going to go to the middle of nowhere. I think that that's kind of like the secret sauce that we have. And the more we talk and help each other, the better. I thought of two questions that I don't think I asked. If I am an artist right now, I just go on your app. Do I need to be at a certain level or at any level? Can I upload my music rights, royalties? Is there any, what, what's the minimum that you can, that you need to have to go in and do this? Well, there's two things. One, we want to see that your music is already completed in distribution channels like Spotify and iTunes, right? So it has to be on either Spotify or Apple Music, number okay. one. Uh, number two, we we looked at very low dollar ISOs, but it really wasn't worth us to go below $500 or $1,000. So if, if we don't think or if you don't think that you have an audience base yet that's going to support a $500 or $1,000 raise, then it's probably not, you're probably not ready yet. Okay. But those are the two elements. One, it has to be complete and in distribution channels that everybody can access. It has to be and making two, some type of money. Yeah, there has to be yeah. some income being generated. Some, some revenue. And then what's the minimum you can invest as a, as a person that wants to invest in music? Five dollars. Five dollars. Nice. We want to make it available for the barista at Starbucks, right? We want everybody to participate. There's other models where it's an auction, highest net worth individual that bids the highest gets it. But that's that's this many people. That's one so person that wins that. Yeah, we want yeah, yeah, everybody yeah. to win. So, so, okay, if I, and, and you said the way to do this is to look at what is projected to make, understand your percentage, because someone definitely asked how much money can you make by using this app, right? But it's very dependent on the song that you use, the projection and what it actually makes. Yeah. So if okay. I own 5% yeah. of something that's making $100,000 a year, I can make $5,000, right? Well, there's, there's, think of it like the stock market. There's the bellwethers. There's like, you know, Microsoft isn't going anywhere. Facebook, you've got Halliburton. Those are older catalogs. Those catalogs, it's pretty easy to extrapolate what the value of that content is and what the expected growth by experts are. And like anything, I recommend a little bit of knowledge. You got to read up on it, you know, and a sync license can definitely change that. But if you're talking about a new artist, if you're talking about, let's say, Takashi early on when he was just on social media all the time. And I'm just using him as an example because the name everybody knows. If you connected with that guy early on and you would have bought into some of his song rights, the value of that catalog obviously would be exponentially more than the you know 10% you might make over the yeah. course of three years. On, on but, but there's risk. That guy may not go anywhere also, right? So it's, it's, it's those types of things where if, you're, if it's someone new and someone local, uh, there's, there's a higher risk. But you could hold those rights. Now, once again, it's a, it's time, right? All right. It's a three year reversion, but this dude never went anywhere, but his song's still streaming. And 10 years later, I made a hole. So, all right. I think, I think there's a good place to end it. Don't leave though. I have, I have some behind the scenes questions for you that uh, the public doesn't get to see. Uh, yeah. Maybe if you pay, you can get access to the back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. I actually have some real, real interesting questions for you. Um, that shouldn't be public. Uh, so thank you everyone for watching Entrepreneur Hour. Definitely go check out Vest. If you are a creator that has your music on these platforms, definitely check it out or at least buy the we'd, music. We'd love, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Definitely. Awesome. All right. So thank you. Thanks, Miguel. Thank, thank you. you Hold on one second. I'm going to end it. But yeah, we're, not, we're not going anywhere. <laughs>